Education is inherently political. Teaching is an inherently political act. The content of our curriculum, the methods of our pedagogy, the temporal structure of our school days, the physical structures of our school buildings. These are all elements that we take for granted as just the way school is. But each of these was an intentional decision based in political will and policy. There are those that wish to tell us that education should be politically neutral and objective. Those are generally the folks who wish to maintain the status quo, and also those who benefit from current hierarchies of power and privilege. As a teacher educator, I spend a great deal of time thinking, studying, and teaching about the connections between society and schooling, between social and political changes, and the lived experience of students and teachers in schools. In my classrooms, we spend a great deal of time studying the history of American public education, which from its very founding in the mid-1800s has been rife with political controversy and political decisions that have impacted students, mostly serving to discriminate, marginalize, and exclude groups of students. A few of the many examples I could name Native American boarding schools, run by the US government through the Bureau for Indian Affairs from 1879 to 1929. They took indigenous children and adolescents from their homes, families, cultures, stripped them of their names, their language, their identity, and replaced that with the dominant white Anglo-Saxon Protestant values, religion, language of the time. This is an example of cultural genocide and one of the darkest time periods in American history. Racial segregation in schooling is rampant and entrenched. Racial segregation was legally required in 17 states of the Deep South, pre-Brown versus Board of Education in 1954. But nationwide, and since its very founding up until today, we've had de facto racial segregation based primarily in racist housing practices like redlining, racist housing covenants, and white flight. Standing here at Nazareth College in Rochester, New York, we're approximately five miles from the district boundary between Penfield Central School District and the Rochester City School District. This is the most racially segregating school district boundary in the country. Rampant sexism denied educational opportunities and access to girls and women, and student with students with disabilities faced discrimination, inaccessible classrooms, and horrible treatment for most of our educational history. Two contemporary examples that we can see in our schooling system and in our headlines across the country are the anti-CRT movement and discrimination against LGBTQ students. CRT stands for critical race theory. It is the complex theoretical understanding of how racism and race work in systemic and institutionalized ways to influence and impact our society. CRT has never been taught in K-12 classrooms, and yet it's been used as a political proxy, serving to restrict access and curriculum about racial justice and the lived experiences of people of color. Discrimination against LGBTQ students is nothing new, but there is a fresh wave of policy, legislation, laws enacted across the country seeking to discriminate against this group of students. One prominent example of this is the Don't Say Gay Bill in Florida, restricting teachers from discussions and curricular content relating to gender identity and sexual orientation. There are also laws being passed across the country seeking to ban trans athletes from competing on teams that align with their gender identity. These are dark times. These are dark moments influenced by political will. In these times, I look to those who are creating hope, who are working for change. And I look to Rebecca Solnit's quote from her 2016 work, Hope in the Dark. In it, she writes, everything is coming together while everything is falling apart meaning that while there are these forces of darkness that seek to discriminate, to exclude, to oppress, 
there are always individuals, groups, and organizations working for justice, working to expand access and representation. So I looked to the students in Florida who are leading student walkouts with pride flags, fighting for their educational rights and access. I look to the teachers in their classrooms who are risking their jobs and livelihoods by including marginalized voices in their curriculum and on their bookshelves. And for teachers who wish to do this work, there are many things that can be done. I've created a list of strategies um, through my studying and research and looking at many scholars in the field a list of strategies that teachers can implement in their classrooms to work to, in more gender-inclusive ways. I've separated them into beginning, intermediate, and advanced steps because based on your context, different levels of things are possible. So whether you have a supportive building administrator, for example, whether you have a state that restricts your ability to do this work through its laws and policies, whether you have the protec protection of teacher tenure, and the support of a teacher union, your personal level of experience and comfort with these issues. All of these pieces of context will influence what you are able to do in your classroom. But all of these strategies, both big and small, will positively impact students' lives. So for the beginning steps, they start with allowing students to introduce themselves to the class, telling you their name and what they'd like to be called. They include not using the gender binary in our language and organization in the classroom. So for example, not getting the attention of the class by saying, OK, boys and girls. We could say, OK, students, OK, scholars, OK, friends. There's so many ways to refer to people in non-gendered ways. Not having students line up at the door in a girl line and a boy line. Not organizing our desks in our classrooms. Girl, boy, girl, boy, girl, boy. The intermediate steps are all the beginning steps, plus things like introducing yourself with pronouns. A side note, I no longer require my students to introduce themselves with pronouns, because that could force a student into a situation where they either have to misgender themselves or out themselves to the class before they're ready. But I model it, and I do it, and I always provide it as an option. It's including material in your curriculum that question and challenge gender roles and stereotypes that are still with us. Things like, only girls can play with dolls and boys don't cry. Right. And then the advanced steps. These are a bit more public and involve potential risk of backlash. They include incorporating queer liberation movements when we talk about the civil rights movements. They include working with students at your school to either support or establish a Gender and Sexuality Alliance, a GSA, or a Pride Alliance on campus. They include working to create and run professional development in your building on these issues. So these are things that classroom teachers can do, but certainly all of us can be involved in this work and working towards gender-inclusive classrooms. All of us pay taxes into the school systems. So all of us have a stake and a voice in the operation of public schools. We can all attend public school board meetings and bring our voices for justice and inclusion to those meetings. We can all educate ourselves about these issues. Understanding terminology that is shifting and changing can be confusing, but there are so many resources online to help educate us. I listed a few here like the Trevor Project, GLSEN, and Gender Spectrum, but there are many available. Advocating at the local, state, and national level for your legislators, calling them, letting them know that you want them to sponsor and vote for bills that advocate for justice for students in schools. And voting is another important thing that we can all do, and working towards justice for all students and teachers. With this work, we can work together to be a light in the dark. Thank you.